Yeah, I, I, honestly, that thus far is the most harmful aspect of his presidency. It's just, it's the complete ruination of any standard of honesty in, in political discourse. And it's, it's astonishing to me. It, it's, it's, I have not yet uh, accepted that this is even possible, m much less actual. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm alone, but I'm uh, continually having the bewildering experience that I just cannot believe this person is president. And it, it really, it, it, it is all, all focused on this particular aspect of his presidency, where he lies more than any person has ever lied in human history. And not only does he get away with it, his, his audience seems to, his, his, his supporters seem to delight in, in his uh, just running roughshod over, over any expectation that, that a, a public figure would be honest. It's, 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 not, it's not a bug, it's a feature for them. And Here's the difference between Clinton and Trump, in my view. When I hear Clinton speak extemporaneously, I hear someone who is well-informed, who is trying to be coherent, but who is also fairly paranoid about saying something unpopular and making a political mistake. So she's cautious to a fault, egregiously so. But I can live with that because I know she can find Pakistan on a map. And I know she knows a lot about what's going on there. When I hear Trump speak extemporaneously, I hear someone very often getting prompted by his own misstatements to complete a thought in a way that he clearly didn't intend to, which is to say that the thing he's now saying doesn't reflect anything he believed or even thought about before. But he's saying it now because the last phrase he spoke just launched him there. Right? It's, it's as though he's speaking in verse and he's forced again and again to complete the rhyme. Hitchens was alive. Who would he vote for in November? And the assumption, of course, here is that given how critical Hitch was of the Clintons, the answer must be Trump or a third party. Now, I honestly think the answer is Clinton. I know what Hitch said about both Clintons. I've read No One Left to Lie To. I've seen the videos of him running down Hillary. I've also seen a video of him not ruling out voting for her in 2008. So Hitch was pragmatic on this point. Trump as a human being, as an intellect or a lack of one, is the walking annihilation of nearly everything the Hitch I knew valued. I honestly cannot imagine him voting for Trump, this man who seems to have never read a book and who speaks at the level of a fourth grader and then mostly about himself. And even then, most of what he says is a lie. So given the choice, I can easily imagine Hitch holding his nose and voting for Clinton. Bertrand Russell, for example, was both a public intellectual and a leading authority within a rigorous field. But the Bertrand Russell who is relevant here is not the author of landmark treatises on mathematics, but the Bertrand Russell who advocated unilateral disarmament for Britain in the 1930s while Hitler was rearming Germany. Russell's advocacy of disarmament extended all the way to disbanding the army and navy and air force, again with Hitler rearming not far away. The Noam Chomsky who is relevant here is not the linguistic scholar, but the Noam Chomsky of similarly extravagant political pronouncements. The Edmund Wilson who is relevant is not the highly regarded literary critic, but the Edmund Wilson who urged Americans to vote for the communists in the 1932 elections. In this, he was joined by such other intellectual luminaries of the time as John Dos Passos, Sherwood Anderson, Langston Hughes, Lincoln Steffens, and many other well-known writers of that era. The standards by which engineers and financiers are judged are external standards, beyond the realm of ideas and beyond the control of their peers. An engineer whose bridges or buildings collapse is ruined, as is a financier who goes broke. However plausible or admirable their ideas might have seemed initially to their fellow engineers or fellow financiers, the proof of the pudding is ultimately in the eating. Their failure may well be registered in their declining esteem in their respected professions, but that is an effect, not a cause. Conversely, ideas which might have seemed unpromising to their fellow engineers or fellow financiers can come to be accepted among those peers if the empirical success of the ideas becomes manifest. The same is true of scientists and athletic coaches. But the ultimate test of a deconstructionist's ideas is whether other deconstructionists find those ideas interesting, original, persuasive, elegant, or ingenious. 
there is no external test. In short, among people in mentally demanding occupations, the fault line between those most likely to be considered intellectuals and those who are not tends to run between those whose ideas are ultimately subject to internal criteria and those whose ideas are ultimately subject to external criteria. The very terms of admiration or dismissal among intellectuals reflect the non-empirical criteria involved, ideas that are complex, exciting, innovative, nuanced, or progressive are admired, while other ideas are dismissed as simplistic, outmoded, or reactionary. Now, what is the Republican Party doing, Trump in particular? Uh, there, was, there was a conference in Paris last uh, December, which tried an international conference, which tried to set some uh, policies to uh, prevent the global warming before it destroys us. It made some progress, not anywhere near enough. But the goal was to uh, reach a treaty among the countries of the world where they would commit themselves to these measures, inadequate measures, but at least some, couldn't be implemented. Very simple reason. The Republican Congress would not accept it. So therefore, there's no treaty, just verbal commitments. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Republican majority on the Supreme Court uh, sharply violated precedent to block measures, uh, limited measures to reduce uh, uh, the ex extensive pollution from coal plants. Well, that's a message to the world, and that message is heard, saying don't bother doing anything because the United States is not going to allow it because of the Republican Party. Going back to Trump, uh, he simply says it's not happening. So I'm not going to do anything about it. Now, that's quite apart from other policies he's advocated, some of which are really hair-raising, like what he said about torture. He said, fine, let's torture people. In fact, the kind of torture that's outlawed by international law and became an international scandal, waterboarding, he says, that's the least of it. Let's do more. Uh, let's keep all Muslims out of the country. Uh, let's build a wall or rather, let's get Mexico to build a wall to prevent people from fleeing into the United States. Now, where are they fleeing from, incidentally? Uh, most of them from Central America, where they're fleeing from the results of our policies, which de severely harm Central America. No time to go to the details. And we go through the rest of it. It's pretty frightening. That's why the world is frightened. But no one judged Vince Lombardi's ideas about how to play football by their plausibility a priori or by whether they were more complex or less complex than the ideas of other football coaches or by whether they represented new or old conceptions of how the game should be played. Vince Lombardi was judged by what happened when his ideas were put to the test on the football field. Similarly, in the very different field of physics, Einstein's theory of relativity did not win acceptance on the basis of its plausibility elegance, complexity, or novelty. Not only were other physicists initially skeptical, Einstein himself urged that his theories not be accepted until they could be verified empirically. The crucial test came when scientists around the world observed an eclipse of the sun and discovered that light behaved as Einstein's theory said it would behave, however implausible that might have seemed beforehand.